Hangul Day on October 9th is a national holiday here in South Korea to celebrate the legacy of the Korean alphabet. So what is the significance of this particular day to scholars? What is behind the growing global interest in Hangul? And is Hangul well responding to its global demand? Welcome to Issues and Insiders. Korea started this work week, that is, with a public holiday to mark Hangul Day this past Monday. That was October 9th. And for more on the significance of this particular day, I have Professor Chiun Ka at the University of Oxford live on the line. Professor Ka, it's a pleasure to have you with us. Very nice to meet you. Yeah. Thank I also, you for having me. Right. I also have Professor Ross King at the University of British Columbia with us. Professor King, as always, welcome to the show. Nice to see you again. Professor Kia, we'll begin with you. Let's begin then with your thoughts on the significance of Hangul Day for those teaching the Korean language and its culture, for scholars in general. I think it's a great reminder and, uh, you know, of course we have this uh, uh, Hangul Day that we celebrate each year, but it's a great reminder that we, are able, we have this uh, tool uh, to express and share our ideas easily. Uh, or originally, that was for only for Koreans, but now that uh, Hangul Korean language become much more globally um, used, so it's a great reminder we have a uh, tool that can easy, uh, easily express and share uh, beyond Koreans. So yeah, I think this, this is great, yeah. Right, and Professor King, what are your thoughts on the significance of this particular day? Uh, for me, it always reminds me um, how Koreans tend to take Hangul and their Korean language for granted, uh, sort of like the air that they breathe. And so actually Hangul Day for me gives Koreans at least one day per year to put down their English language textbooks for a moment and to remind themselves what a si remarkably significant intellectual achievement the Korean alphabet was and still is. But I think also to reflect on how incredibly popular the Korean language has become outside of Korea and at the same time how kind of spectacularly unprepared Korea still is in so many ways for this newfound popularity of their language and their alphabet. So I think it's a, a, at a time like this on Hangul Day uh, today, this year, when Korean popular culture is enjoying such remarkable success, I think Hangul Day should prompt all of us, but especially Koreans, to try to think more, uh, think more strategically and more long term about how to improve the infrastructure for teaching and learning Hangul and Korean. Right. And, and staying with the popularity of Hangul, Professor Ka, an analysis by an online American platform for language learning shows that Korean surpassed Chinese to settle at seventh place last year. What do you believe are the broader implications of this particular finding, Professor Ka? Yeah, I, I think this is quite funny because, for example, like uh, when Squid Game uh, viewers increase, that I look at Duolingo uh, statistics that go together. So it's very interesting that you know this K, uh, you know, K culture um, and the consumers not only just consumes, but in a way that while you're watching the drama or you know consuming other K culture, they also got great interest in language itself. So for example, like they have great uh, you know. Uh, 2021, uh, two years ago, we had about 7.8 billion tweets about K-pop. So people actually come and then talk about the language and the bits that they didn't understand, and also they learn the language. And I think it's really, um, in a way, I argue that Han Hangul uh, could be, you know, the next to tell you, then tell you, uh, 4.0. That in a way, like people are interested in language and the alphabet, and I think it's really uh, encouraging that you know that they just don't think about this as traditional. If they, um, you know, enjoy and consume, that's it. But then they also learn language. Means that it could do uh, sustain, and it could, uh, you know, the, the the Korean cultural popularity and our influence could grow uh, beyond this time. So I, mean, I think this is very encouraging. Right, you know, right. Yeah. Professor King, simply speaking then, how popular is the Korean language and how do you explain the increased interest in learning it? Um, well, at, at virtually every level uh, where we teach Korean outside of Korea, I'm speaking for North America, uh, whether it's K to 12 or university level, we're all turning students away. We've been turning students away from our programs for uh, many years now and that's just because our programs are full. We don't we don't have enough capacity. We don't have the teaching staff to accommodate. There's just way more demand than we can handle and way more applicants than we have places. And that's true right across North America, um, where I teach 
here in Canada, at the University of British Columbia, and at the University of British of Toronto in the East. We've been turning, literally turning away hundreds of students uh, for the last few years from first year Korean, just because we can't handle this increased demand. And it's all because of Hallyu and, and K-pop, basically. Mm. Professor Ka, what can you share with us then about the interest in the Korean language among those in the UK and elsewhere in Europe then? Um, I think it's yeah, very similar to the uh, North America and actually globally. But I, I found what is very interesting is that the fandom learners, those who are you know following the K-pop and K-culture and learning the language, the, the sort of in, um, interesting sort of the range and diversity of those group. Uh, of course, you know K-pop uh, fandom mostly young people, but then now because of drama, they also have you know the fandom fandom learners who are not like young people. So in a way, it's a really interesting phenomena that um, uh, impacts uh, you know, age uh, insensitive, you know, like what I mean by diverse population group uh, to learn language. And I think this is uh, something that yeah, you enabled uh, people to, uh, to learn language. And it's uh, really um, happening all over the world, uh, Europe and UK. So I have few workshop examples that uh, I, I thought the main, mainly young people, but then I also uh, found many people who, I know their 30s, 40s, they started learning Korean because simply they watch drama and watching drama is also something like, you know, only not only the ensuing the content, but it enables them to be to have some sort of verbal footage from the drama and then you know they learn become interested in the language and word itself. So it's in a way Hallyu itself is promoting the Korean language in in UK and Europe. Right, I see. And Professor Ka, is is Korean considered an easy language to learn for foreigners, do you think? I, I don't think so. It's uh, you know it's one of it's considered as one of the most difficult language, and the reason is because uh, of pragmatic complexity, and you know in order to learn different registers, you need to be exposed to the real situation. But uh, so you have to basically come to Korea to learn uh, you know how it's used. But actually, drama enables virtual immersion. So people watching drama are actually able to quickly pick up those pragmatic complexity. So I think it's kind of changing the, the dimension or perception. So it has been always considered one of the most difficult languages to learn. But because of drama and uh, virtual immersion, they experience young people. So they don't really think this is you know too difficult. They can easily master different registers by watching drama. So it also has uh, different. Uh, dimension to la language learning. Right, and staying with the same question, Professor King, what do you think? Do you suppose Korean is an easy language to learn for foreigners? Well, being a foreigner myself, I would say it is definitely not easy to learn. And I'm I'm 42 years and counting, and I still uh, find it difficult. So yeah, it, it's a it's a lifelong commitment to do it to a high level for sure. Uh, the issue is that there aren't there are still very few opportunities for learners to go beyond that first year of study where that's where all the, the demand is right now. We have, we, we're turning students away from first year. Uh, but then after one or two years, they're basically kind of dropping out. And I think this is something that all of us as Korean language educators and, and that Korea as, as a country needs to kind of really turn its attention to how, you know, how do we retain more of um, these learners that are coming to us because of their excitement for Korean popular culture. And I think that's kind of where my focus is right now is how do we keep them? Right. And before we delve into that, Professor King, do you suppose Hallyu is the main reason then behind the surge in interest in Hangul? No question. Absolutely. Uh, that's that's why we're seeing all these uh, these new enrollments. And so that's a really positive thing. Um, but again, um, what Hallyu has also done, I, I think it's it's not all positive. It has also essentially exposed the many weaknesses in our infrastructure for teaching a Korean language uh, to foreigners, both inside Korea and outside Korea. And I think, um, again, Another distortion that Hallyu has introduced into Korean studies is that we're now seeing more and more that when new professorships come up in Korean studies, they tend to be focused on K-pop and on Hallyu, on, on Korean media. Um, but Korea is not just about K-pop. So yeah, you know, I don't I, I really want to stress that Hallyu is great in terms of all the, the increased uh, demand, but we need to really do some traffic control and some long-term planning to make sure that we can keep the students in the system and, and that they learn that Korea is, is more than just Hallyu. Right. And staying with what Professor King has just said, Professor Ka, do you also agree that current instructional responses with regard to Korean are failing to meet the rising global demand? 
Yeah, I agree. So basically, I think sort of we may be, you know, able to provide the first, uh, you know, stage care, but continuity matters. And as Professor Ro uh, King said that, you know, it's important for us to be able to help them to maintain that interest, as well as, you know, helping those are uh, the initial learners. So and uh, sort of also, I think, uh, you know, you know, people, we hear this uh, message that uh, learners, you know, waiting in the list that Sejong uh, uh, school have a big long list, waiting list, too, but, you know, so there are huge interests. So it's important to, you know, meet the, their demands, but also to help uh, the, the, the learners who are learning, uh, you know, to sustain their learning and to help them to maintain their learning. And in order to do that, I think the most important thing is that, as uh, Professor King said, other things, you know, cultural impact important, but we also need to realize that language is at the foundation of this K-culture and K-wave. And also probably if I add one more thing is that, you know, it's a new generation, language learning in itself uh, has, you know, transformed over the last five, six years. Uh, uh, learners and students learn using the apps and new technologies. So AI would be our new, uh, tech, you know, new, new challenge, how we incorporate the digital technologies into our classroom and how we kind of able to help them to learn better. That would be our uh, remaining challenge. Right, uh, and speaking about approaching this language, this teaching method, Professor King, I believe you founded a Korean language and culture course at Concordia Language Villages, which we talked about earlier this year, I believe. Professor King, could you tell us a bit more about this particular course and how does it seek to engage students? Well, so it's targeted at K to 12, so students before they're at university age. And um, I think the key point is that it's not, it's not, it doesn't happen within the four walls of a traditional classroom. Um, so it's 24 seven residential living together, it's immersion and it's all about learning Korean in a community. And what that does is it creates an incredible um, enthusiasm about the language and culture. And, and it is heavily cultural because it's not in the four walls of a classroom so that the cultural aspects are kind of organically included in what the villagers learn in the village. Um, you can't, I mean, any good language education uh, is going to include uh, culture uh, in in its program. The problem, again, is that there just aren't enough opportunities for these villagers once they go to the language village and graduate from high school. Um, there, there are so few opportunities still uh, to continue their studies once they go to university. And there are also really very few incentives uh, in the form of scholarships uh, for them, for example, to go study in Korea for a year, this kind of thing. So it's this kind of, I guess, um, creating for our learners uh, a, a road that they can see, a, a path forward that they say, oh, if I stick with this language, there's other places and other programs for me to go to and ultimately I'll be able to go to Korea. This I think is still a real weakness for Korean language education. And that's why I think we're still seeing so many drop out after the first year or two of, you know, sort of very introductory um, learning. I see. Professor King, this is an impromptu question, but I'm aware that last year yeah. you were here as a visiting scholar at Song Yung University. Was your trip perhaps aimed at trying to seek a kind of connection between those interested in learning Korean in America and the programs here in Korea at Song Yung University? Well, yes, except if you, if you think of um, Korean language education um, as a kind of pipeline, the language village, which is for kids from ages 7 to 18, is sort of the entryway into that pipeline, then you've got university. But the program at Sung Yung Gwan University, which is an inter-university center for advanced academic Korean, is really the very end point near the exit of the pipeline, where these are very advanced students that are needing to learn Korean as researchers and as scholars and therefore have to learn academic Korean. They need to learn hancha, they need to learn, you know, um, sinographs or Chinese characters. Sometimes they need to learn hanmun. Uh, and so this is sort of the very, I guess, top end uh, of, the, of the proficiency scale. Where we're also, I think, very poorly served still for um, foreign learners who really need to, to learn Korean for, you know, very high, high proficiency professional and academic reasons. So I'm kind of doing both of those things and, and the Sun Gyun Gwan project is really the, the, the higher end. Right, I see. And speak about the higher end. Professor Kerr, I wonder how important is Hanmun in learning Hangul, do you suppose, for foreigners? Um, I think sort of uh, Hanmun will enable them to read the text that they, you know, for example, like, uh, you know, those are learning um, the old pre-modern text 
uh, in these Korean studies, they would need Hamun. But I think sort of um, what we have in more or less contemporary Korea, we uh, have rather than Hamun, we have Hanjao, which you can actually uh, have uh, without the knowledge of Hamun. So I encourage them to learn Hamun, but actually, you know, very much uh, if you are learning, learning Korean, uh, they would, I mean, I, I don't think they read a lot of Han Hanmun, uh, the Chinese characters, but then some of, many of my students come from, you know, Chinese and Japanese backgrounds, so they kind of know Hanmun, and it helps them to understand the background, and, you know, have more enriched cultural knowledge, but I don't think that will be the requirement for learning Korean uh, language. And, uh, yeah. Right, I see. Uh, Professor King, I, you've spoken about the challenges out there to further promoting Hangul in the global arena. And that all being said, what more can you tell us about the existing challenges and perhaps some possible or potential countermeasures to these challenges? Uh, sure. Well, so I think Korean language education is probably unique in the world in its really heavy dependence on Korean funding for its very existence. And it's also unique, I think, in its near total, in de near total dependence on South Korean government funding uh, to survive. So for me, the biggest challenge is getting away from our crippling dependence on just two South Korean organizations, namely the Korea Foundation and the Academy of Korean Studies. And the funding that they provide is welcome, it's helpful, but it's not competitive with what other major economies like Japan and Germany have done for their languages in the world. And it's nowhere close to what we need for meaningful change and improvement uh, at this current moment where Korean is so popular. So, um, and furthermore, when you're taking money from Korean government organizations, you always have the same problems of bureaucracy, inflexibility, lack of imagination, and nationalism. So what we need is to diversify and bring in NGOs. We need, uh, we, the corporations should be helping with all of this. And so far, Korean corporations have a very poor track record of helping anybody with Korean studies uh, outside of Korea. Uh, private foundations need to be brought into the mix. And in North America, where I am, I think the Korean community should be stepping up its support for Korean studies as well. So basically, Korea needs to be doing more aggressively what Japan did for over three decades for Japanese studies and Japanese language education, which is to build an infrastructure that will survive if and when Hallyu crashes and burns. Right. And, and Professor Kier, what more can you add with regard to these challenges and uh, potential countermeasures? Yeah, I think it's kind of, I really second uh, back up what Professor King said, but also I think it's important to actually um, to, um, you know, have the infrastructure or, you know, for, for example, like, you know, I'm in the UK, but UK government to or Department of Education to be interested in in Korean or, you know, like include Korean as one of the foreign languages. I think this is kind of important step that Korean promoting Korean language is not like all done by Korean uh, government and Korean scholars, but we have to kind of raise the awareness from the, you know, the local government and their educational authority, the importance of this language and what, what else sort of educational and overall benefit it can bring, not only for, you know, some K-pop fandoms, but, you know, in general society, what language learning itself <clears throat> could bring. And so I think it's important that we uh, also talk and, uh, you know, able to engage with the, the educational authorities in, and you know, the local, you know, places like UK or, you know, Europe or North America, so that actually, the, uh, you know, the authority, educational authority in the country may have the responsibility and take more, you know, lead on Korean language education than South Korean government. Right. And in the meantime, then, Professor King, speaking as a foreign scholar of the Korean language, what perhaps was your secret to mastering, if I may, Hangul? <laughs> uh, Hangul is easy to master. It's the, it's the Korean language that's the problem. Um, and if, you know, if I can go back to something that Professor Kyar said uh, about Hancha, and I, I hope my Korean colleagues uh, won't, won't kill me for this, and I hope that King Sejong will not be turning over in his grave, because basically, uh, here we are talking about Hangul Day, but I think if you really want to learn Korean to a really high level, you have to learn Hancha, and you, you have to at least study them, and you have to learn, you know, the Hancha, oh, the, the, the Sino-Korean vocabulary that goes with them. So um, it's, it's one big package of which Hangul is just one small piece, and Hangul, as I say, is a, a brilliantly designed system that fits Korean like a glove. Um, 
but it's not the same thing as the Korean language, which is, you know is a lifetime project. So uh, we need to keep building that infrastructure for both teaching Hangul, teaching Korean language, and for those advanced learners who really want to reach a high level are also learning Hanja uh, uh, systematically. Right, of course. As always, Professor King, thank you so much for your insight today. And Professor Ka, thank you very much for your time and your thoughts. Thank you. Thank you. Right, well, on that note, we end Tuesday's edition of Issues and Insiders. Thank you for watching.